caffeine. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much at the end of week one for finding the energy and finding the route to be able to make it to us to join us here today. Uh, my name is Claire Schein. I'm the director and CEO of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, uh, otherwise known as CISL, or for our global network of 20,000 alumni, CISL. So I'd like today to sizzle, and although we have a frightfully grown-up concept note, I think this is a small gathering with really amazing speakers where we can think about some straight talking uh, that feeds into next week, but into the decade to come. Mm -hmm. So it's a great chance now to take stock, but also in my favorite phrase, to call out tomorrow. And we have that reminder of the protests and the activists who are going to be marching through the streets today, calling out tomorrow. And people on this platform and in this room are people who are architects of tomorrow as well as of today. COP26 was always going to be pivotal. Obviously, it was the big five, now six year, uh, big moment after Paris. But other events have, beyond the data, the reports and all the rest have really changed the lens around COP26. It's not just extreme weather events that leave no country untouched. It's also that COVID has had a whole set of forcing functions about things that were already wrong in the system, but it has brought it into light. So even the most determined ostrich can no longer bury his or her head in the sand about, for example, the integral links of health, nature, and climate, the staggering costs when we, as businesses or companies or as an international system, fail to be risk literate, the gaping cracks in what we call solidarity, whether that's domestic or international, the interdependence, obviously, of the global economy and supply chains. We've seen the dominoes come down post-COVID. And the cascading risks across society at every level, particularly for the most vulnerable, when we don't take the above, the things I've just talked about, seriously. So at the moment, there's lots and lots of buzzwords, you know, from net zero being the new sex on the street, to build back better, to regeneration. And they reflect something big and messy that is coming up to the surface, which is an understanding that systems change is essential for people, nature, and climate. And what I'm feeling here, and it resonates with my past career, is that expectations for more clarity, and more integrity and better ways to measure without getting stuck in acronym soup. New standards, new commitments. Will the first week be pledge fest or will it be something that the historians of tomorrow will look back on and say, this was a moment when it did change? So a huge responsibility and a greater opportunity for business, finance, government and international organisations. And that's the nexus at which CISL works around the world. Uh, we see non-state actors, business, SMEs, and so on, as critical to the transformation, and our panel can talk to that in more detail. Uh, we are ourselves focusing on innovation and decent work across supply chains. And I heard a lovely phrase, which I don't know if it's original, this week from Pascal Sorio, the CEO of AstraZeneca. And he said, we are all the scope three of someone else. Now, maybe that's, you all know that, but I hadn't heard it before, and I really liked it. Um, and the other thing I'm hearing and seeing more is this willingness to collaborate at whole sector level for bolder policy and, and implementation, as an example, education and training for upskilling and green jobs. Uh, so that excites me. We also see a huge emphasis on private finance, that governments cannot do it alone. Business must move further and faster but that a bolder policy playing field is essential if we are going to send the right signals to the market and reward first movers and proper innovation. So that, that's more than enough from me. Um, I want to reiterate that this event is being live streamed. We hope there's lots of lovely people out there joining in. Please feel free to put your questions on the feed. You in the room, please feel free to take questions. And this is just the start of a conversation, uh, so it doesn't stop here. 
So, first panel, where have we got to? Uh, we have three wonderful panels. It says that I should now invite them to join the stage. They were very smart because they already joined the stage. So without further ado, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and their work very briefly and to pull out a couple of things that have delighted or horrified them in this first week. So our, pro our first provocateur in chief is Rachel Kite, who is now the Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University, but has an extraordinary career, which she'll also give you the highlights of. <laughs> Rachel. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think my first COP I went to as a youth delegate and, uh, and then um, had a career in the multilateral development banks, uh, civil society, um, and then investment, uh, and ended up as the Secretary General's Special Representative for Sustainable Energy. Um, and so I do a number of things. I think most pertinent uh, at this COP, in addition to bringing a lot of students here, is um, that I'm the co-chair of the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative. And if voluntary carbon markets are going to be part of the solution um, and not part of the problem, as many indigenous peoples, representatives and stakeholders here fear, then we have to build integrity on the science. The science is better and more unequivocal than we've ever had. Uh, and then if you have science and then you build integrity onto that, then you can get to scale, not the other way around. <clears throat> uh, so, well, it's been, for those of you who are not in Glasgow, hello. Uh, it has been a beautiful, sunny, autumnal week here in Glasgow, which is not what people predicted. <laughs> Will the weather hold? I think that's the big question, because I think uh, the negotiations are tough. There's some very tough things that have to be negotiated. Um, and uh, to have two weeks of sunshine in November in Glasgow would truly be a miracle. Um, so I think th there is a bit of a pledge fest going on. Um, uh, that's not all bad. Because, as we know, um, you know, sometimes you say something and then you have to figure out exactly how you're going to do it. And when you have governments pledging to net zero, I'll come back to that, financial sector for the first time, really, I think, the leaders of the financial sector getting really serious about what net zero means, and then businesses continuing to ratchet up their commitments sector by sector. And when you've got aviation and shipping and steel and cement, and all of those hard to debate sectors also coming to the party. You've got that there is something here, there is, there is the beginning of momentum, but it has big caveats. The International Energy Agency sort of tweeted out yesterday, I think, that if you now add up all of the pledges that governments have made, that we're now at, you know, we're on a pathway to 1.8 by the end of the century. Well, it's from our lips to God's ears, right? That, <laughs> that's a pledge. It has to be turned then into concrete action. It means that you have to be able to compost your food and you, your village has to have an anaerobic digester. It means you have to be able to uh, buy that heat pump at a reasonable price with a government uh, subsidy so that you can flip to green quickly and that you don't feel that you're going to be worried that you're going to be cold this winter. I mean, we've got to do that kind of work so that we bring everybody along with us. And that's the gap at the moment. Yeah. The policy undercarriage for the NDCs is not there in most countries. The public, uh, the public wants uh, green in most countries, but they, 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 they worry that they, uh, that they may uh, not be able to afford it. Great. So that has to be changed. I'll stop you there, but I love that phrase, um, policy undercarriage. I think that, I like that one. We're going to bring in Tony Danker, who's the CEO of the Confederation of British Industries. Tony. Uh, yes, uh, I've been at the CBI for a year now, and uh, well, how to reflect on the week? I, so I agree with Pledge Fest, but I, I heard Al Gore speak the other day, and he said something which I found very interesting, which he said, you know, cops are not either Paris's or Copenhagen's. You know, those were one-off highs or one-off lows, and this is about the overall arc. And I think what the Pledge Fest represents is two things. One, one tactically, an approach by the UK and the UN to ensure that uh, the perfect is not the enemy of the good and getting 190 people to agree about everything is unlikely and therefore let's build snowballs and I think they are hoping that these things will snowball rather than unravel uh, <laughs> over the course of the next week and I think that's a pretty interesting different tactical mm -hmm. approach I mean Rachel will know more than me she's been to more cops but that feels like a quite an interesting almost tactical uh, uh, thing to try uh, I think the business piece is really new and fresh and interesting mm -hmm. and is approaching step change uh, world. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that both uh, His Royal Highness, the Prime Minister, Secretary Kerry, the new language is 
government does billions, but the private sector does <laughs> trillions. Right? Yeah. It's, like the, it's sort of like an Austin Powers movie. But I, <laughs> what, I, what I think is really intriguing about it is we haven't really gone to the next step, which is so how do you unlock that? Right? And, and you've got this sort of incredible sight of, of Mark Carney, who's done a wonderful job, saying, OK, I think we've got the money. I mean, yeah. now what? Right? Yeah. How, how do we put this to work? And I said last night that I, I think what 2022 is going to be about, and I think the UK government is now just beginning to get into this, and I'm glad they are, because I think the UK leads the way in lots of places, and I think it's going to have to lead the way into the hard stuff yeah. as well. And that is government moving from being green rule makers to being green market makers. Mm. And, and I think these require some new skills, right? It's about thinking about market mechanisms like you know, contracts for difference in offshore wind. It's about thinking about the role of reporting and disclosure and how it genuinely drives pretty quickly rapid climate action uh, by firms. It's about thinking about pump priming markets, exactly as the government, I think, are trying to do on heat pumps. It's about, frankly, take, changing our tax system to in order to reward those that go green rather than those that don't. It's about thinking about our regulatory objectives. You know, economic regulators have got two objectives in this country. One is, you know, to keep prices down for consumers, and the other is to essentially keep high levels of competition. But they don't aren't under obligations to drive up investment or innovation or indeed net zero. And so I, I'm intrigued about, okay, number one, yep, private sector does trillions, not billions, got it. Number two, uh, private sector needs to make commitments. And I, I think the IMF have done a lot of media calls and everyone's like, it's all greenwashing, it's all greenwashing. It's not greenwashing, right? The CEOs don't come to places like this to greenwash. You don't send your CEOs for that. CEOs are coming because this is now incredibly real and they're thinking about highly significant investments. Uh, but what's it really? What's the next step now? So you asked us to look forward, right? What's the next step? Now? Uh, let me let just. I'm going to bring Jessica in now, if I may, and then I'll come straight back to you on the next step. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So Jessica Fries is the uh, executive chairman of Accounting for Sustainability. So I want to pick up on that because yeah, you were talking about how we move it forward. Jessica. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so Accounting for Sustainability, we work with all parts of the finance community. So I think that the point there around. How do you turn commitments to action? I think is a, is a really key piece that we clearly work on. Um, coming into this COP, I, I confess I felt pretty pessimistic um, about what we were going to be achieving. But at this midpoint, I, I would agree that there is a real sense of momentum. And I think one of the things that's very different about this COP is really that multi-stakeholder perspective that we're really seeing coming together. And we know that to tackle the scale of the transition at the pace, at the speed, we really need every actor to be working together in consort with a similar level of ambition. And so I would agree, now we need to look at how all of those ambitions can be realized. I think most organizations, when they're setting net zero pledges, for some they may have a sense of how they can get there, but at the moment, very few, and I think most are pretty honest about that, really know the detail. But the key with, a, with setting a really ambitious target is that it drives the ambition, it drives the investment, it drives the kind of innovation that we're going to be needing, and it acts as a really motivating, mobilizing, and quite positive force within an organization. So I do think that the, the, the commitments are really key. Um, one of the other things, though, that, that we've seen, which I think is about putting that, that architecture in place that will be key to holding people to account in terms of those commitments and giving us the kind of information to assess within an organization, but then outside of an organization to hold, hold people to account um, are two additional announcements that were made on, on Wednesday, which was the, the finance focus day. One was around, um, within the UK, transition plans. Mm -hmm. And I think with a lot of the investors we work with, we've seen a, that, that real focus on um, wanting to see more detail from companies about what their transition plans are. And I think part of that is what are the near-term targets? So what is the, the one year, the five year, the 10 year, um, as well as the, the 2050, the 2040? Um, targets which many have announced 
And so that, I think, is where a huge amount of work has already happened, but we will really see over the next year more and more coming out um, so that people can really look at those pathways, scrutinise them, do things like compare the amount of investment going on. And this, is, this comes to the really techie work that, that we at A4S do around things like capital investment. And does the, the numbers in the financial statements stack up with the commitments that are being made at the front half of the, of the annual report? Um, and that brings me to the third of the, I think, the key announcements on, on finance, Steve, that um, is really the result of um, the work of many, many people, but um, from an A4S perspective, well over a decade ago when the Prince of Wales, well, Prince of Wales first set A4S up back in 2004, and his vision at the time was, was a recognition that we didn't have 21st century reporting and decision-making systems commensurate with the scale of the problem. We have 20th century systems, and we really needed to think through how we could um, drive those forward. Over 10 years ago, we set up something called the International Integrated Reporting Council with that vision that sustainability reporting really needed to be at the heart of the financial reporting infrastructure. And so one of the big announcements on Wednesday was um, finally, <laughs> at long last, but a, re a really important step forward from the, the accounting world was the announcement that the International Financial Reporting um, Standards Foundation has set up an International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, it's merging that organization that we set up, the IIRC, which itself had brought together all of the key players, along with something called the, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. So they, they're part of the Value Reporting Foundation. You can see from all of those different acronyms, the fact that there's huge simplification and coming together of a huge part of the current reporting infrastructure. The focus will be on the capital market. So we do have a few, a few um, questions in terms of how that will really deliver what is needed. Um, so I don't think you're quite at global standards yet, but a huge milestone. And to provide all of those investors who have pledged that 130 trillion um, of how they're going to be shifting capital, it's the kind of um, architecture, the, the plumbing within the system, and so really important. Fantastic. So having, I, I choked off Tony, but I'm actually going to jump down straight to Rachel both to comment on things you've heard, but really focusing this panel's discussion on really what are those tough changes? What are the things that we really need to see happen? So Tony, hold the point I interrupted you before, but I'll let Rachel start first in terms of what you see as now these toughest changes and what can leaders and others really push for, but also any reflections on what you've heard yeah. from your fellow panelists? So I, I think, so it's about guardrails and ratchets. Um, so uh, guardrails, there is greenwash, Tony, um, yeah. as a, enormous amounts of it. And uh, it's got, it, we, I think the business community has got to call it out amongst each other, as well as having the street calling it out and investors beginning to call it out, right? So I think it's the guardrails around that which means that Rishi Sunak's you know, announcement of mandatory transition plans is really important. So we have to go from voluntary to mandatory. So if the UK leads, then we've got to take other jurisdictions into mandatory transition plans. And the ratchet has to be really fast. We don't have time. So every year you're going to have to come back. Every two years you're going to come back. I agree that IISB is really, really important. Integrated standards. You're going to need to have a lot of help. Developing countries don't have the bandwidth to think through the policy carriage, so you're going to need to help on the government side, and then we've got to make sure that this doesn't become some kind of exclusive green club. So mm -hmm. developing countries have to have access to capital markets on reasonable terms. We have to do much more to get the financing into these countries for the green transition while we choke off the money that's going to brown, and you've seen all these announcements of no more public finance for coal, no more public finance for oil and gas from a leading, co leading coalition of 20 countries and organizations now so that's closing down because there's no money there anymore but we've got to then at a commensurate level put the money into the green transition so you, it's all of these levers have to be pulled at the, at the national level and at the global level and the one other thing I would say is in the Secretary General's opening speech he said that he will convene an expert group to basically indicate what the guardrails are for net zero so that if we can't be disciplined enough about our net zeros that he will he will put those guardrails in place and i think that that's appropriate and necessary i know that there's some people were like you know well we've got a race to net zero why does the secretary general need to say that well because there are people in the race to net zero who should never have been allowed to get to the start line uh, we know who they are 
And we've got to be really serious about what a net zero claim is. Nobody says it's easy, but uh, that honesty and that transparency, which is being negotiated at the moment and will be tough, will be important. And so mandatory, I think, is the key for that. Brilliant. Tony, let me bring you in now. Yeah, look, I, I agree. I, I think, unfortunately, the Treasurer is saying where she's... Uh, Rishi's requirements aren't mandatory. And, and I think we do need to get to uh, mandatory, standardised accountability for corporates really quickly. Mm -hmm. And the sooner that we do, you know, the, the, the sooner that we have sunlight on what's really going on. And actually, the sooner that businesses have some visibility about where they rank compared to their peers, that's where mm -hmm. it gets really interesting. Yes. And, and I actually think, uh, I think uh, the account, talking to the accountants this week has been the most interesting thing for me, which is really understanding What's going to happen in reporting? Is it going to be simple, simple, helpful, <laughs> uh, impactful? Is yeah. it going to be benchmarkable? Because to, you know, we had a dinner of 700 corporates mm. last night talking to them all. You know, the minute what the minute we have straightforward, science-based, evidence-based disclosure in a way that's highly comparable to our peers across markets, I think this thing will move unbelievably fast, yeah. and all of a sudden, governments will look unbelievably slow compared to how quickly good disclosure will unlock incredible transparency and an unbelievable set of benchmarking, you know, not, not only just sort of thrust upon corporates by investors or the markets, but, you know, just, you know, the, the crowd uh, will, you know, I think things will rise to the top or, or will fall out. And so I think that is a vital next step. I, I'm worried actually Rishi stuff isn't mandatory. And I'm worried that, you know, if it becomes a, a bloody bureaucratic art of everybody telling yet more qualitative stories in a way that's completely different to the way American companies tell their yeah. stories. And, you know, we're back, we've gone back a step, not forward a step. But look, there's only one way to get started. There's only one way to do this, which is to get started and iterate and make it better. So let's do it quickly. But underpinning what you've been saying, Tony, is this real question about the test for leadership, which is this is the moment for the, for the policy vision, courage, and boldness in order to unleash the capacities you've just talked about in business or, or we've got the standards and so on, but you need to have that, the undercarriage to be right so that then it can move forward. Jessica, I mean, I talked about, you know, net zero being the sex on the street, but now I'm knowing that you know, accountants have suddenly become the, the new sex symbol, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure I'd quite go that far, but definitely, <laughs> definitely, um, definitely a key to, to really um, achieving the kind of ambitions. I'd like to come back to that question of, of Greenwash, because I, I think that that's part of what the, um, the challenges, the focuses, but then also the, the, the phrase that is being used around green hushing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be a really delicate balance of how do we get the right balance between those two. I think mandatory is key because I think for a lot of organisations will just decide that they want to go under the radar. Um, I think that that is one risk. And so those that do make bold ambitions and then potentially can't find the right way to meet them, but their intent is genuine, and they really are putting the investment, the, the work in to try and get there, I think it could act, if, if there's too much um, negative focus and calling out of some of those who are making ambitious and authentic and genuine pledges, um, could deter others. And so I do think you need that very strong mandatory underpinning that creates that level playing field. Um, and then I think there's quite a lot of thinking that needs to be done of how can you differentiate between an ambitious pledge that is genuine and is backed by the action, um, but maybe falls short with one that is there just to buy time and to you know, carry on doing business as usual. And actually, that's where I do think things like um, accounting, both looking at the, the financial numbers as well as some of these um, climate and, and social and other commitments and targets that are set, because that can give you some quite good in, um, insights into whether there is that consistency. And that's one of the reasons why this coming together um, of the different types of standards is really key. One, one final point on, on the sort of standards accounting side, and picking up on your point. I, I do think at the moment we're, we're on track to get differences in different big jurisdictions. Um, 
Europe has focused, is, is, is um, at pace going forward with standards looking at the full impact, so what they're calling double materiality. Um, the UK has signaled that they want to actually, in, when it comes to climate, they will use the ISSB standards, but will also add on impact. And I do think that that is key. I don't think we will get to net zero unless we're looking at what impact an organization has on the world and the impact that world has on an organization. And I think that that's what, to be honest, investors want as well. That's what the net zero pledges are about. The two are so deeply interconnected that I don't think you can divorce one from the other. So I think that that is going to be a key first test of the ISSB of can it reconcile those two different perspectives and drive further consolidation. Rachel, sure. yeah, can yeah. I just, so the, the, the reason we need regulation, right, uh, so mandatory, is is for all of these reasons and it's but there's two to focus on one is without the without the mandatory without the regulation it's difficult to make sure that this is equitable mm -hmm. and uh, as well as uh, driving towards 1.5 the second thing is is this point about how do you reward first movers and how do you reward those who are really going the extra mile so when you regulate you can set the standard and if that's you've got to clear that but then if you can go you know tier one tier two tier three tier four above there should be some great premium in there. I think when you've got the regulation in place, then you know the capital markets, the financial markets can start to do their job. But I think one of the things that I hear here is that those who are going first, those who are really doing the best that they can do, there is no little, there's very little reward for them in the market mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, and I think we have to get better at rewarding those who are, are pulling everybody else with them. Um, so underpinning that, <coughs> excuse me, is how does business <coughs> and non-state actors raise the bar for the policy actors in that sense? You know, this question you were talking about. Do you want to say a word on that? And then we might take one question from the floor, Tony. Yeah, look, I, I, so just in a UK context, I mean, I, I think the reason why the UK has to solve this first is because uh, the UK spends a much lower percentage of its GDP on green investment. Yeah. You know, it was 0.55%. We think it may have got to one. The EU is 1.8. The Americans are 3.4. And we have a government that is now uh, feeling like they need to get more fiscally conservative, feeling like compared to historical UK spending, mm -hmm. they've spent an unbelievable amount of money. Now, that's fine, you know, but we've got a lot of global companies in membership who will tell me stories about the offers they get from European countries compared to UK companies in terms of subsidies. So if the UK is not going to compete mm -hmm. in public investment terms in, in, in essentially uh, the transformation of a green economy. It has to be the best in the world at unlocking green markets. Regulatory frameworks, reporting standards, deployment mm -hmm. of capital, uh, you know, tough questions about regulation, exactly what you'd said, you know, reward, rewarding those who do and penalizing those who don't. Uh, my biggest worry, if I'm honest with you, is actually I, I'm not sure we have the capability really it, of that smart market design. Mm. Even the, it, and I've been spending the last six months looking for it, by the way, either in <laughs> government or in business yeah. or in regulators to say, who can really pull off the next set of you know, offshore wind market design across our economy? And that's a capability gap that I think we're gonna have to get really good at. But that's, that's great. So you've identified, that was my final question, really, the immediate action or the top priority to... Um, yeah, market design. Uh, green market design. Well, in Britain, anyway, it's green market design. And, and just to be clear with everybody, just to Rachel's original point, you know, we stood up last night and said very clearly to all our members, right, you're either taking a lead or you're left behind, right? Uh, and if, you know, any business in this, in this world who thinks that they can protect the present and ignore the future, I mean, it's business school 101, right? When, when the future attacks the present, <laughs> Right? Don't try and protect the present. Race to the future. We do it in every single area of business strategy. Anybody who thinks that that's not the answer now is just going to get left behind. Fantastic. Jessica, a final sort of call to action or top priority yeah. for you? So I think there's two things we haven't touched on, both of which are connected. Um, we're sitting here in Merchants um, Hall. <laughs> In George, which is in George Square in Glasgow. Um, so today, the Friday for the Future strike will be ending here in George Square, and tomorrow there's um, additional protests. I think we haven't touched on the level of anger um, and demands from a lot of people in terms of the failure of action so far. Mm -hmm. And I think that that level of anger and pressure is only going to ramp up as we see the consequences of our inaction 
Um, we ha and and that, that's the second piece we haven't touched on is resilience. So we know that we've already baked in huge um, amount of physical impacts from climate change. And so I think as those physical impacts continue to bite, um, of course, that's another thing that for, for business and finance, really focusing on how they can invest to build resilience and prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis from impacting individuals and their lives and their livelihoods. But we know that that is going to happen. So I think that we haven't touched on that. And then linked to that is the other form of anger that I think you do see or fear, which is as a result of the transition um, and social justice. So how can we have that just transition? Otherwise, I think that we will continue to see huge um, anger and fear from those communities that risk being left behind. Um, and I think that that, again, could act as a huge barrier to progress. Um, and so those two forces, um, I think we really need to demonstrate swift action and for all of the business, finance, and political community to be very rapidly demonstrating that all of these pledges are real and that that progress is tangible. Fantastic. And Rachel? Yeah, but what, one point, just, just building off what you said, is that I, I think we, we, we talk about adaptation here and adaptation finance in the, in the context of the COP. It's often about transfers of public money to developing countries. I, I, I think there are many, many companies that have not understood the financial issues for themselves in adapting to climate change. So transition risk, uh, just the amount of uh, assets at risk uh, under different scenarios of, of, of adaptation. And I think that that's a massive catch up. Um, we tend to have the private finance discussion around mitigation. Um, and then secondly, is that certainly the companies that I talk to uh, don't believe that they've got access to the talent pipeline that they need for this mm, yeah. green yeah. market that we're going to be building. And the education systems in most developed countries, let alone most developing countries, are not producing or not yet <coughs> investing in the blue collar and white collar skills yeah. that we need for that green economy. Yeah. We better catch up yeah. quickly. It's yeah. a burning bridge. It's going to be a break on how fast we can go. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm living and working in the US at the moment. I mean, I just don't see anybody like screaming about the burning bridge, except for the private sector. So um, that's something where we need to come together too. Brilliant calls to action. Great clarity. I knew we could have gone on for a lot longer. Okay. But thank you so much, all three of you. And um, we're capturing a lot of these key points because, of, you know, this is not going to stop here. Thank you. I'll ask you to sort of leap like gazelles off yep. the stage. <laughs> and while they are um, elegantly descending, um, points that Jessica raised about anger. Uh, as Tony can confirm, we were talking about people and power just bef beforehand. It's a huge issue. And as I mentioned, we have a global community at CISL. So although we are very cognizant that so many people cannot possibly be in Glasgow, we wanted for, our, for the first time to put together a short video of the call to action and the views that are coming from around the world in some members of our network. So we're going to bring the video up now. And after, um, after the video, uh, my wonderful colleague, Nina, will launch the next panel on what's next. So if we could bring the video up now, please. At COP, we have the opportunity to finally get an agreement on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, addressing carbon markets and ensuring that the targets set six years ago are achieved. For the first time that different countries uh, on the earth have a common objective because we want to res restore the balance of the environment. Uh, we want to stop the global warming and we are now aiming at the same direction. The main opportunity in COP26 that uh, this is the last chance for us to commit to below 1.5 degrees. We have seen how the global crisis can affect the global economy and world leaders have to act now for the uh, mitigating and adaptation to climate change. 
because we wouldn't be able maybe to control any uh, unforeseen climate crisis in the future, uh, unlike we did with the uh, COVID uh, crisis. The first opportunity is that there is a global awareness created because of this, you know, observed climate extreme. The second one is that there is improved scientific evidence with high level of confidence that can provide strong foundation for decision making. The third one is there is this technological solutions, the advancement in technological solutions, getting more affordable and more accessible. It's a big opportunity to address every other crisis because they are all interconnected. If we talk about justice, social justice, food production, the loss of biodiversity, all crises are connected. So our big opportunity is to rethink everything. I think the main barriers to change is ultimately this silo-driven mentality where you've got civil society, state, academia, and the private corporation all saying very different things. Ultimately, we need to bring these four spheres of influence together to shape positive change. And I believe that we are all getting to a mindset where the time to act is now. And what better way than seeing civil society, state, corporation, and academia pulling together to make a difference. The net zero transition pathway touches upon all parts of the economy. So we're all collectively responsible, from the producers, to the exporters, to the consumers. But things are just not moving fast enough. The current carbon budget left for the world is shrinking year on year. We not only need to invest in nature-based solutions, for example, but we also need to ensure that countries and sectors abide by their commitments in a consistent and transparent way. Mandatory disclosure and reporting aligned to global standards should be introduced without delay. One of the most common barriers is the limited knowledge of mid-level management of climate risk-related issues, their consequences on business and even on their personal life. Uh, another common barrier, but uh, also an opportunity, is the lack of access of funding and capex expenditure for increasing energy efficiency in operations. The main barrier is, the, I think, is the lack of commitment at different levels, uh, especially uh, by, you know, like developed countries, because they have commitments towards developing countries. There are more promises and, you know, very ambition, ambitions of promises, but there is less action. On the other hand, uh, developing countries have more strategies and, and action plans, but less implementation. We need to translate these promises into into actions and, and, and strategies into uh, investment plans and actions on the ground. Those most affected by the crisis are now not being heard. And those looking to make a change do not have a chance. I will summarize uh, three P's. Number one, uh, polarization of development. Number two, politicalization of the uh, relationship or country to country relationship in terms of our differences as, uh, as a humankind. And number three, procrastination in our uh, discussion and actions uh, in terms of the climate. I'm expecting from the leaders to keep the momentum of pledging commitment and mobilizing finance and also utilizing COP27, which most probably will take place in Egypt, in Africa, to concentrate more on the global south and that climate action in the global south. So both COP26 and COP27, I'm expecting a lot from leaders to commit more to climate action mitigation and adaptation. I want to see more integration of the scientific approaches to decision making. And I would really like to see realistic targets associated with dates that are not 2050 or 2030. We do need to, look, to be looking at short term and measure impact and progress in the short term. We are living in an increasingly dense world and spatial sustainability needs to be a counterpoint to social sustainability. We need to think about cultural preservation and the ability to preserve who we are and understand where we are going. And finally, let's use technology wisely to ensure that it enhances our lives and also can actually help reduce our overall consumption and thus lead to a greener future for future generations. This journey has to be as inclusive as possible and create new jobs, sectors and provide opportunity for enhanced prosperity. The most significant contribution 
that we can make to tackling climate change is financing the transition to net zero. Financing is key to building a sustainable future and one of the most important aspects is to ensure that it flows to all parts of the world. The recent wave of net zero emissions pledges from many countries is most promising and this momentum needs to increase. But ensuring that pledges are translated into immediate actions, long-term strategies, and of course, effectively implemented is the type of leadership we need now. We need leaders who believe in the science behind climate change. We need leaders at every level, young and seasoned, who bring their passion and action into the communities who most need support. This isn't a question of racing against the clock. We need to stop and restart with a sustainable mindset. Thank you very much. If I can, in our absolutely wonderful next panel to come up and take their seats. We've got, hello and welcome. We've got an absolutely difficult job today of trying to look into the what's next. So maybe reflecting on the video that we've just listened to, um, Dr. Wu was talking about polarization, politicization, and vaccination. So how do we change that to institutionalize immediate action and to look at it being inclusive. So I guess we have quite a bit to talk about. I will actually come and stand over here a little bit because otherwise the panel can't see me and I can't see the panel. So I'll try to rotate between the, the both of us. We've got a really interesting and actually really cross industry panel with us. We've got finance, we've got the business here. So let me introduce them and we'll hopefully have a uh, fascinating discussion, including hopefully some questions from the online as well as some questions from the audience. So we've got with us today Wendy Clark, global CEO of Denso International and a member of our business transformation group. Paul Spence, director of strategy and corporate affairs at EDF and a member of the CLG. Um, Gonzalo Sainz de Mier, director of climate change and alliances at Iberdrola, also a CLG member. And we've got Janet Pope, Chief of Staff and Group Director for Sustainable Business, Lloyd's Banking Group. And um, Lloyd is a member of CLG, the Banking Environment Initiative, as well as a strategic partner. So lots of um, titles there. So if we start that conversation, so reflecting on what you've seen today, reflecting on what you've seen over the last week, what action do we need to take? How do we convert that commitment into action in a relatively immediate future? So if I start with Wendy. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for being here. And secondly, we apologize to the microphone man if we sat in the wrong seats. <laughs> I think hopefully he's got it right. Um, look, I mean, I think that last panel was so articulate and so clear about the, it needs to be urgent, uh, it needs to be science-based and bound, uh, it needs to be measurable, and there needs to be accountability. Um, and so I think, you know, sort of taken together, um, we have to make sure that the science-based targets are on a pathway to 1.5 degrees. But there's a little bit, you know, that, that can get, get lost a lot when we see the uh, announcement of targets. Um, I think we have to do more frequency of measuring. So we've, we've heard we've got to bring them much more into near term. We can't just have long-term projections and not be measuring in the near term because we can lose track of things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the first American voice in the, in the room. You know, we say what, what gets measured gets done. A good American euphemism, and I think we've got to measure more frequently. Um, and I think uh, to what Tony said, we've got to be able to create the demand in the marketplace. So a marketer sits here and goes, look, we can create demand in the marketplace. We can create consumer desire. That's what we do. And if you create the demand, the rest of the ecosystem will flex accordingly. So we see our role very specifically about that consumer behavior change, that consumer demand that will then bring the full ecosystem you know, in the direction that we need it to be. Thank you. And maybe if I go to Janet next. Yeah, I think there's something about keeping it real. Um, and quite a lot of the discussion that we have, certainly that we have in financial services, but I'm, I'm sure it's not restricted to us, is around Somebody earlier mentioned the, the enemy of, uh, of the good being trying to get things perfect. And we spend a lot of time talking about oh, it's just so difficult to manage and we need convergence of measurement standards and so on. And yet we need to be doing things now. And, and if we can't get to perfection in terms of measurement standards, it shouldn't stop us from getting started with some of the really critical things that we need to do. And I think that resonated from the video just now. It, this isn't about 
paper decarbonisation. It's not about sending signals to institutions that they can find ways of making their reporting look good. It's actually about making a difference in real people's lives as of tomorrow. I think the speech that has moved me most during the course of the last few days was Maria Motley, uh, Mia Motley, sorry, the Prime Minister from Barbados, who said a two-degree rise is a death sentence for island nations. And here we are thinking, you know, the difference between 1.5 and 2, you know, we're on trajectory for 3 plus, but, but the difference between 1.5 and 2 is still a death sentence for those island nations. And, and that's a very heavy fact that we have to, I think, keep, you know, close to our hearts and know that unless we can arrest that, then, you know, we're, we're not making the progress that we need to make. So keep it real. Mm -hmm. And on that point, Gonzalo? Okay, good morning to everyone and thank you for inviting us. <laughs> I have to say to congratulate the Corporate Leaders Group because for, for us, we are members of all of the alliances and the Corporate Leaders Group, I think, is the most powerful alliance, a more practical alliance in Europe supporting this kind of, 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 uh, of vision. I want to start saying that for us, we are visualizing at the COP really important things. Uh, we are visualizing the terminology revolution that makes this change possible. And we are in the power sector, we will talk, but also for the transport sector, for everything. We, we are seeing that the 10 biggest economies of the world have presented uh, objectives of net zero for mid-century. We are seeing growing pressure from the investors on fossil fuels. And this is extremely important hmm? because we are showing that the the financiers are internalizing the climate risk. And finally, we are seeing growing support for action, especially from young people saying that a radical change is possible if we want. Mm -hmm. However, what do we need? I mean, the, the, the speed is not enough. So we need for us is implementation. We need policies now because we have the technologies now. And yes, this decade is good, but we have to start it now, this year, next year, the following year. So. I think in this context, we need what the European Union has presented, a set of policies to achieve the 2030 and 2050 objectives. Apart from that, we need action from all agents, not just governments. We need action and commitments from firms, from banks, from regional governments, for cities, from cities. And the last thing, and of that, we need objectives and measures to, to, to achieve it. And the last thing is we have to build or to strengthen alliances. So, because the change is, is so, we are, we, are, we are talking about changing the whole economy, and in particular the energy sector, and this is not easy. So we need to build alliances, to build alliances on short-term policies, on the closure of coal or decarbonization transport sector, no alliances on 2050, but alliances on measures for the next five years. That's quite cool, Paul. Uh, crikey, come, come last and following a, a first um, you know, outstanding panel. I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, just reflecting, I mean, we heard, we've heard a lot about ambition. We've heard a lot about sort of the engagement of businesses and finance and about urgency. And you know, yesterday was the energy day of, of COP. And, you know, there was a really, really clear, really strong message that I heard from pretty much everywhere that we need to get on with it at real pace across both proven, you know, deploying the proven technologies, the things we know that work today and getting those going really quickly, as well as working on the things that we hope will work for the future and developing those at, you know, at real pace. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, to, to follow some of uh, the, the, the same themes, I mean, a sector the energy sector, I think, has the ambition. You know, a lot of us are, you know, Iberdrola, EDF, members of organizations like SPTI, you know, Race to Zero, you know, pat, you know and phasing out coal, all of that, you know, that's, that's real tangible action. There's then the industrial action to do the next piece of the thing, which is, you know, let's get on with building the things, the wind farms, the solar farms, the nuclear power stations, the things that we know are low carbon that we need to do. And at the same time, let's make sure that we're doing that in a way that is working for the people who are involved in this. You know, there's, there's technology, but there is also people. And that's the communities that are involved, that's the customers 
who we want to work with, you know, organizations like Wendy's, you know, the next phase is going to be a lot about engaging people in changing their lives, changing their lifestyles, choosing things like an electric vehicle rather than an internal combustion mm -hmm. engine, mm -hmm. choosing a heat pump rather than a traditional boiler system, choosing to use less rather than cranking up the temperature and you know, keeping a t-shirt on. All of those are changes that involve our customers in changing the way that they work. And that, you know, Gonzalo's point about collaboration groups to make that happen. And one, the group that hasn't been talked about a lot, and I, I would just emphasize as the final thought, is the people inside the organizations, mm -hmm. inside our own organizations. You know, we've been doing a lot of work this week, but before, with organizations like uh, Fresh Blue Clima to look at whether or not we can take, we can turn the thousand, sorry, 10,000 people inside our organization into 10,000 activists mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. in the same way that Greta and the activists are going to be marching outside. It's turning our people into those activists as well. Thank you. And, and actually, if we start as we mean to go on, right, we've spoken about the what. But I'm going to rephrase the name of the panel a little bit, and I'm going to reconcentrate us on the how. Mm -hmm. yeah. How? What, what are we going to start doing now, and how are we going to move past this? So reflect on the video. So Dr. Abrahamat talked about realistic short-term targets and action. So how do we institutionalize that action now? Wendy? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to pick up where Paul just left off, because I do think you can start from a business perspective inside out. Um, we're members of the WEF um, Alliance of CEO Climate Change Leaders. Those 90 of us signed that open letter. We represent 8 million workers across our 90 companies. So you start with that 8 million, right? And we start to say, by the way, two thirds of the workforce by in the next five years will be millennials. They, their activism is already wired in. So we are looking at transitioning workforces anyway that are already acting and, and creating expectations of us as business leaders. So I think the easiest way to get started is start inside out. Start with your own people. You know, equip them to lead and live and play in a different way to, with different, you know, more sustainable, restorative lifestyles and behaviors. They go into the world then and start to, to populate. Obviously, from our little space in the world, where we work with clients, we work with 95 of the top 100 advertisers in the world. Think about then that sort of start as a starting place. If 95 of the top 100 spenders in advertising in the world started to spend differently around their products, their services, you know, really driving different consumer behavior, creating those green markets that Tony was talking about, then you start to move forward. So I think we've all got to start where we are. Think about our immediate sphere of what we can impact measure and hold ourselves accountable to making that progress within those spheres. And those, you know, then you start to create those concentric circles and create that wake of opportunity that starts to move in the, in the marketplace. So that's what, that's what we're doing. I like that connecting of climate change is here now. So millennials are here now as well. And I suspect there's a lot more millennials in the room than, than we think. And actually following up on that, people point and picking up on Nasha Grill and Ines uh, Yabar who was talking about connecting climate to people and ensuring that this is a just transition. Uh, Jen, can I pose that question to you? Yes, of course. I, mean, I think some of the territory has been covered. but, um, <laughs> but uh, we're, So we're an organisation. We have close to 30 million customers. And whilst, of course, we've got to do all the efforts that you've just described around making sure that our people internally are really up for this journey and are, are big enthusiasts and out there advocating, We've got the connections with those 30 million customers that we need to work with too. So, and there's a there's a big effort there, I think, which is incumbent on all of us to to guide, not just to put the products out there and say come and buy these, but to guide our customers in terms of some of the challenges that they're facing. And at Lloyd's Bank, we have a, a very significant market share of of small business companies. You know, they're still struggling to find their way out of the pandemic. They're not thinking. You know, the local hairdresser isn't thinking at the moment about using less water and how they manage their carbon footprint. They're thinking about whether they can afford to stay open and pay their business rates next month. And so working alongside our customers on helping them to find their way through their transition, there's a big need for education and information and the right products to make it easier for people to embrace the challenges that they know they need to face into. 
So bringing up that client relationship function so that they're able to help their clients move. Uh, that's an absolutely fantastic point. And I guess um, directing a slightly more difficult question to, <laughs> and reflecting on Mr. Fahmy's comment uh, to Gonzalo. Gonzalo, how do we bring Global South into this conversation in a much more structural way and how do we support the transition there? Okay, the first thing I, I want to say is that the technological revolution of clean solution makes easy this transition. Because nowadays, for instance, with the revolution, technological revolution of renewables, today wind and solar are the cheapest way to produce electricity in, I don't know, 90, 95% of the world. Mm -hmm. So, this is possible everywhere. But, I think we need four things. The first, we want investments in those countries and taking into account that there are capital intensive investments, we need an adequate framework to foster those investments. And I'm talking about I don't know, fiscal policies, the financial policies, fair transition policies, of course. Hmm? And so this is one thing. The second thing we need is to assure the delivery of the 100 billion euros to support these countries on mitigation, but also on adaptation. It was mentioned that adaptation is, is, is they are suffering the worst effect of climate change. Uh, we are causing the effects. Hmm? The third thing is technological transfer to these countries. So we have the technologies in the power sector, in the transport sector, in the building sector, even in the, in the hard to abate sectors. So we have green hydrogen that we think is going to be competitive to decarbonize the hard to abate sector in six years because of the reduction of cost of uh, electrolysis and the reduction of cost of renewables. And going to that, I think it's very important that those countries realize that they, have, they can take advantage of their natural resources mm -hmm. because they have renewables. They have a lot of renewables, those countries. And for instance, green hydrogen can be more competitive in many developing countries than in northern countries that have less solar or less sun or less wind. Fabulous, and actually just following up on that adaptation and resilience point. So how are we going to be building in adaptation and resilience into our day to day? So, I, I mean, we're, we're living through a, a very real illustration at the moment of the challenges of, you know, what, what needs to what's happening and what needs to change in the in the energy sector you know we're we're seeing unprecedented mm -hmm. costs of energy at the moment and you know for me it, it it's illustrating a couple of things because there's a lot of talk about um, the topic of resilience where it's it's about physical resilience and you know are assets at risk of flooding and have we designed for for you know that that future or putting in the protections that are needed but Resilience is also about financial resilience, mm -hmm. and we need to be thinking about an energy system in the future where the risks are properly understood, where we've analyzed those risks. I mean, I think Rachel talked about that earlier on, the need for corporates to, to focus on mm -hmm. what the risks are and to make allowance or to do things about, about those risks. I would also argue for the need for organizations, whether they're governments or whether they're companies, with broad shoulders to take some of the risks. I mean, you know, we're, you know, the UK energy sector at the moment, we're seeing a lot of companies failing. I would argue for some of that because they, they had not the capability to take on some of the, the risks that are, we're going to see in future. But the really important thing is that we don't allow us that to knock us off course we collectively need to stay the course through the current period. We know what we need to do. We know the things we need to deploy. Actually, we know that we need to deploy that faster. In the energy sector, we're about, in the UK, we're about a quarter of a way to what we need to do if we are going to have a secure, reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy system in the future. We've got a decade, maybe a decade and a half to get the other three quarters of the way there we've got to really accelerate. And so that's what we've got to do to create resilience, is go faster than we've done so far. And the acceleration of that transition will also leave a little bit more room for the global south to, to start coming up and mm -hmm. to start developing. Yeah. 
if, if, if the North uses up too much of the resource that remains available, then it's not going to be there for the South. We, you know, we in the North have the responsibility to go as fast as we possibly can to help. And we will see a lot more of the social fissures, effectively, that we will be seeing today as well. So I'm very keen to have it as a conversation of, around the room, as well as with the panelists, because I, I assume we can talk among ourselves for <laughs> ages. <laughs> so let me just first start and ask Annabelle. We've got nothing coming from the online so far. <laughs> Brilliant. Always good to know. Um, have we got any questions in the room? very faintly, so maybe if you stand up and project the voice, which is not very COVID-like, but... Hi there, my name is Jen Hamilton. Um, what I find interesting um, about the discussions today and generally on this topic is a lot of the discussions around finance are, I guess, aimed at, you know, the mobilizing of finance. It's aimed at the, I guess, the large corporates. So I thought it was interesting the point that Janet made about the smaller businesses and how they cope. But what I'm even more interested in, I guess, is the mobilization of consumer finance. So, you know, how we all spend our money is much more powerful, I think, than anything else. But we haven't got that transparency that we've been talking about at the public company reporting standards level. And if we could um, drive that consumer labelling on products, on services, so that consumers can make comparisons, I think we would really accelerate. But how do we do that? How do these institutions and the panellists and the jobs that they do help drive that? Because if we can do it for public health and food labelling, why can't we do it on carbon? That's, I mean, I think that's a supremely important point because we've also, we've started with a regulation on the pension side so that when we're actually looking to our pensions, we know what we're investing in. But maybe if I pass this to Janet? Yes, of course. And then Paul. Uh, uh, wonderful. Yeah, so a couple of disconnected observations, really. One is, I think there's a real role for innovation. So we've been rubbing shoulders with all manner of people that we've never met before nor expected to be in conversations holding a glass of wine with. And I was talking to somebody from a big tech company the other day about an innovation that they're planning to enable you to hold up your smartphone with something a bit like a QR reader and take a read on what the carbon content of the thing was that you were about to buy, whether it's that new pair of trousers or the, the packet of tofu that you were about to pick off the supermarket shelf. And I mean, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Just so that people were properly informed about the carbon content of the thing they were about to buy. And then a point I've been dying to make for ages is around the fact that none of us can do this by ourselves. And, mm -hmm. and so here's a Lloyd story that makes it very real for me. Almost exactly this time last year, I was trying to get our motor fleet people, and Lloyd's has got the biggest motor fleets in the UK, our motor fleet people to really embrace electric vehicles and come up with targets for how many electric vehicles we were going to have on the road within you know short time frames. And the conversation was all around, well, we don't really know what the residual value of electric vehicles is, and the technology keeps changing, and it's a big risk, and of course, we'll go as fast as we can, but it, that wasn't fast enough. And then through discussions with government, which is this kind of collaboration point, you get to a place where the UK government comes out earlier this year and says no new internal combustion engines after 2030. And so as soon as February, the conversation with those same people was, I don't know what the residual value of internal combustion engine cars is going to be. We're getting quite worried. And just, I mean, it was like a, 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 you know, somebody had flicked a switch. And, and if we'd not been collaborating with government, trying to figure out where government could help us take this, you know, government can send really powerful signals to capital to tell it where to move to. And so with these kinds of dialogues and with pressure continuing to be brought to bear, I think we all move forward. We, we move forward collectively. Nobody can kind of stick their neck out and say, we Lloyds Bank are going to fix it. We need everybody else to be in the room with us trying to make it happen. But thank you for your question. No, if I, if I can, I mean, just to build on Jan Janet's points, I mean, I completely agree about, you know, the, the fact that, you know, would be fantastic if we can get to the point where, you know, whether it's with a QR code or whether it's product labeling in the same way I can tell the calorie count, if I could tell the, car the embedded carbon. But that needs collaboration. It needs my customers. You know, if I'm making the 
energy that uh, my customers are using. I need to be able to give them a, a, a clear and understandable view of that. Mm -hmm. That then needs to feed into their processes. So you know th that point about you know we are all somebody's scope three becomes mm -hmm. really important. And you know the thing that makes me positive is I am seeing an accelerating pace of activity in the UK from organizations like the Competition and Markets Authority, from the government, to develop the standards that people can rely on, that customers can rely on, and that we can use as a basis for some of that reporting. You know, we need, again, to accelerate that work. I mean, it was running on a relatively sluggish timetable. Mm -hmm. Collectively, I think, again, and it's an area where we can collaborate. If we're putting pressure because our customers are demanding that we give them that information earlier, then the politicians will move faster. I'd just, I'd just add on our own research, uh, UK research, by 2030 consumers' uh, mindsets and demands are shifting so dramatically. By 2030, the majority of consumers will be buying and brands and, and from brands and companies that have an outward position around decarbonization and sustainable good. Um, and so you're seeing, we're in minimal years now, we're going to go from a minority of consumers feeling that way to a majority. And that, again, that consumer demand will get the attention of, of companies and brands to, to do the right thing. This app has been talked about for years. We've been talking, you know, I was at Coca-Cola several years ago. We were talking about a similar app. So it's just got to happen. There's, there's, there's a little bit of it is the ability to actually know that data. I don't think it, it's not a problem of technology. We could rock up with an app in a, in a week. It's do you have the transparency? Do you have the understanding of your value chain to really be able to say at the point of sale, here's what's inside this singular box of something. And I think it's the hard work behind it. So I think look, one, of the, one of the pieces we all talked about intersectionality, which I think is obviously huge. The other thing I think we've got to be careful of, and it was mentioned in the earlier panel around greenwashing, I think we have to make sure that the, the narrative people, the people who can talk it and say it, are side by side with the technicians on this. Because that's what, you know, what's happening in that gap is our narratives get really good, and then our actions are missing. And we can't confuse progress with activity here. And so I think we've always got to, when we talk to business, that's why I hang around with Anna Longley right there, because she's our technician, and she doesn't let my narrative get ahead of where our actions are. And so we've got, that's how we've got to press business, is to not just say it, again, sort of all the pledges, wonderful, where, where is your, where's, your, where's your math, where's your spreadsheet, where's your measurement, where's your accountability, what have you done lately? Talk in terms of narrative and accomplishment, and don't let those two detach. Brands can do that, though. They absolutely can do that, and consumers want it. So you're seeing, again, the ecosystem is, is absolutely moving, but we've just got to keep it connected and not let that intersectionality fall apart. And actually, picking up on that point, we did a really interesting piece of research a couple of years ago with our investment leaders group, surveying American consumers' mind about their preferences on investment funds. And if they were able to see effectively sustainability information on their investment funds alongside the profitability information. And by far and large, if they see that information at the same time, they will pick the more sustainable fund. Absolutely. So the consumers are not only gonna get there, but are already here, a lot of them. So we just mm -hmm. need to shove that tech up. There was a question in that corner of the room. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. My name is Owen. I work for Nestle, uh, based in Switzerland. Um, uh, you, you, you kind of slightly stole my thunder with your comment there at the end around uh, investing, but I'll, I'll tweak my question a bit to make it uh, slightly different. So I guess, you know, is there a need for a new compact with investors around the transition costs and the, um, the expectation on margin that goes with that? Because if you have very you know, you've seen it in the energy sector, lots of disruption, lots of increasing cost. You see it in the food sector as well. Input costs are rising very dramatically. And at the same time, we have to decarbonize. We have to stick to a consistent path. Otherwise, it will become impossible. Um, so I guess my question to the panel is, what's your view on how investors are balancing risk and reward based on the need for consistency in reducing carbon emissions, whatever the, the short-term headwinds are facing publicly listed companies? Say something? Of yes. course. <laughs> I can talk about the power sector, but 
in the power sector we have experienced a, a tremendous change in the last 10 years. And we are seeing now that investors are not supporting or are not investing in fossil fuels, not for social responsibility, because it's climate risk. And the point now is that the green solutions, and this didn't happen 10 years ago, 10 years ago with, with the recovery after the last crisis, supporting renewables meant a loss of competitiveness and profitability. But now it's the opposite. So we are seeing that investors are internalizing the risk of climate change in their decisions and they are supporting clean technologies. So for us, uh, finance is, is, not, is not a problem, I would say. We have the technology, it's the most competitive one, we are ready to invest, there is money around, what we need are policies. And this is the key. Policy is what changes the behavior of firms and behavior of consumers. So we need a set of policies and coherent policies, but we need to change, it's like that, all policies. We need to change the fiscal policies based on the polluter based principle. We need to search to change the economic policies because those, those, those policies were approved for a fossil fuel economy. And we have to change all these policies. And fair transition, of course. But I think Europe is going into the right direction because it's, it, it makes sense. So my view is that if we move in this direction, we have seen a positive development, but if we see more implementation and with uh, of policies and with adequate leadership for politicians and also from business and with the technology there, we can move to a more sustainable, more prosperous and, and fair economy. Can I just give you a, t a tangible power example of that, which is um, a few years ago, EDF in the UK, we, we signed up to the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Mm -hmm. And at the stage we did that, we had here in the UK two very large coal power stations which were being used during the winter to keep our lights on. And the, the UK very sensibly put in place the arrangement with a price on the carbon that was being emitted. And progressively, that carbon price caused us to look at the operation of the coal station and to say it no longer made sense to run it as much as we were, mm -hmm. and progressively to get to a point where one of those stations has already closed and the second station will close September by September next year. And it's running a tiny portion of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's all because there was the right financial framework in place, the right policy arrangements in place. From, from our perspective, that made the investment decision a relatively straightforward thing. Then we had to think very carefully about how do we manage a just transition for the people who were working in that station, in those stations. How do we find them the next career working on the green technologies that are going to replace coal in the system? And again, you know, we've done, I'm very proud of the way that we have worked through that with our people, with our unions, helping the 400 people in the station that's already closed to you know, move on to the next thing. And again, why did we do that? We did that because it was the right thing to do, but also it was the economically right thing to do because we needed those people with those skills in the growth areas, in the new areas. So with the right policy framework, it's easier for business to do the right thing. And our job is therefore to help government mm -hmm. in the UK, governments everywhere, set up, the, you know, Tony talked about making the markets. That's, I think, mm -hmm. what it's all about, making the markets and then the capital will get deployed and the returns will be there and the investors will put their money into those things. Can I just follow that out a little bit, Nina, because I think there's another really important people angle there around trying to reframe the losers as, as people who stand to benefit from the changes that are being worked through. So, so Paul's example is a really good one. The, another one which I think I learned from CISL some, some time ago was the, the coal workers in the Ruhr region who were turned from people, you know, who, who, who would in all conscience send human beings underground to dig out coal? You know, we've been doing it for centuries, but it's just the worst thing imaginable, isn't it? And those coal workers are now working on landscaping, making tourism facilities, f filling lakes with fish, 
just making something that's much more pleasant than, than human beings going under underground to dig out coal. So there's something about re-engineering the whole value chain, but also thinking really hard about the people who are at the center of some of those equations. And if you can turn them from being framed as losers because they're losing their jobs in the mines and turn them into people who are doing much more agreeable jobs for the future, then that has to be a win-win all round. I just put a button on it. Someone has to sit on those investor calls. delivery. So investors expect the margin delivery from publicly traded companies and they expect the ESG transition, which means in the middle of those two thoughts is innovation and creativity and ingenuity and rethinking your business because you're not going to get margin relief. But you also are not going to get relief on the questions around ESG, rightfully so. So we've got to, we've got to rethink, right? We've got to innovate and we've got to change how we're operating because you're going to get both of those questions. So we have four questions in the room, and I'm just going to point to, there's a lady in the back over there, then, and I'll take three, and then hopefully we'll have one more to come. Hi, um, my name's Katie, I work for RAP. We're an NGO, and we work with consumers and businesses around the circular economy. Um, I'm interested, so we, we run a couple of campaigns in the UK influencing UK consumers on sustainable lifestyle choices. And I'm interested in your, I was really interested in Wendy and what you were saying about the power of consumers making choices. Um, I'm interested in your views on what might be the risk points over the next few years where we might lose that momentum and buy-in with consumers. Um, there's obviously like economic weather around price pressures and loads and loads of other factors. And as we plan our um, work with sustainable lifestyles and citizens, we're kind of trying to think about what's on the horizon, what should we be looking for and thinking about in the future. Mm. Thank you both, there's just here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's on the phone. Uh, phone friend. Sorry, that was good timing, wasn't it? Um, yeah, great session, so thank you. Uh, James Stacey, I'm a partner at ERM. I'm, I'm also a fellow with the CISL. Um, I actually had two questions, if that's allowed. Um, the, the first one, um, got pen. the first one relates, it kind of connects the two panels really, in that we heard about anger in the first panel, and earlier in the conversation you were talking about um, how we mobilize the consumer, um, and I guess my question is, you know, how, how, do we, how do we close the gap between the anger that is growing within society and the consumer choices that those same, those same people take day to day? So how do we close that gap? Second question is quite different, actually, and it relates to the capital markets and particularly to debt finance. Um, we've done a huge amount of work with banks over the last two to three years around their, their, um, their, their response to um, the requirement to evaluate climate-related financial risk and then how that has shifted into aligning lending books with temperature outcomes, whether that be Paris-aligned or Net Zero-aligned, et cetera. Um, and indeed, the carbon compass that JP Morgan issued is an example of that kind of work, if you've seen that. But my question, I, I guess, more to the, to the energy companies on, on, on the panel here, is, is are you seeing that kind of really quite forensic and sophisticated analysis now of the lending book by banks start to feed through in terms of a, a lower cost of capital for the low carbon um, the low carbon projects that you are building out um, as on the other side of the equation high carbon assets are now seeing a higher cost of capital or indeed a, a, a challenge to get capital at all thank you james and if we can james person, but a super short one okay literally super short because we're almost done james person over there Thanks, Beth. Uh, James McPherson, CISL. Um, so we've heard already today that uh, addressing the social dimension is going to be key in, um, in, in being able to effectively decarbonize. Um, and I think the same is, is true for investing in nature as well. Um, how can companies uh, make sure that they're, when they're investing for decarbonization that they're also getting things right for society and nature too? Perfect, and you've got the nature. So we've got two consumer ones, which I'm assuming gonna to go to 
1D. We've got the energy one, and we've got the nature one, and I'm assuming nature is going to have to go to Jenna then. <laughs> When do you okay, start? really quickly on, on consumers. Please. I mean, I, in the macro, in the aggregate, much like Jessica was talking about the two sides of the anger, I talk about the two sides of the risk. So yes, there are certainly risks around, will we truly drive that demand and that adoption? Will those new markets materialize? Will companies really act with transparency? I mean, we can go through the risks that will happen. But on the other side, thinking about supply chain availability, uh, you know, thinking about workforce and labor availability is an equal risk. And again, if two thirds of our workforce are gonna be millennials who are going to join and opt in and out of companies based on their mission and their purpose, you may not have a workforce if you don't make this transition. So I, I actually feel that the risks are on, on both sides of this equation. I think we've gotta do a better job at highlighting the risks of not actually moving into being that type of brand, that type of company and the vulnerability of you actually being able to source the, the, the supply um, and value across your uh, supply chain and your, your workforce. So I'd answer that one that way. The second consumer question was? The second consumer question was, how do we close the gap between anger and consumer oh. choices? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think, again, uh, so median age at my company is 27, median. So we have 45,000 people meeting. So I, I work around this generation so much that that is palpable every single day. If you, if you are immersed with millennials and Gen Z right now, you, you feel their anger and you feel their, their, their demand and expectation that the brands are, are going to move in this direction. So I actually, I, I think that anger can convert very nicely into, into consumption with, again, transparency of labeling, but, but Jennifer was talking about earlier, about transparency of commitments. Um, uh, I think you're not going to see again, by 2030, majority of consumers will shift their consumption and, and investment. So we, we, you know, we're talking about less than 10 years now of that actually being a real reality. And of course, that's gonna continue to drive in the, in the interim intervening years. So I don't think you're gonna see that gap for much, much longer. Energy question? Should I take it? I mean, is there evidence that in the cost of capital uh, for the projects, um, you know, either for a higher cost of capital for projects that have a higher climate impact, climate risk, or a lower cost for those that are traveling in the right direction. Absolutely, it's part of what we're asked all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, a, as one, I think, of Europe's largest issuers of um, green bond debt, you know, we, we at EDF have seen that there is a real appetite where we can show that there are projects that are about investing in low carbon mm. options, you know, in wind farms, in solar panels, then there is real appetite for that. And you know, with the appetite comes a you know, competitive market and therefore um, a lower cost for those projects. To complement on what you are saying, I completely agree. There is also this regulatory certainty or regulatory risk. And for instance, I think one of the challenges I had is like how the governments are dealing with short-term crisis. For instance, we are seeing the economic, I mean the, the uh, energy crisis, price crisis in Europe due to uh, natural gas uh, uh, price increase. And how to deal with this short-term uh, turbulence that we are going to have it in the future? Because I mean, we are we have to in to faster, we have to go to a faster uh, decarbonization and faster development of renewables, but today we have this. So these short-term decisions will influence a lot in the regulatory risk on the cost of capital of investment. So the way governments deal with short-term effects have to, uh, in crisis have to be aligned with these long-term uh, objectives and decisions. Thank you, and maybe Janet, picking up on the cost of capital and nature, uh, yeah, cost of, I mean, uh, I don't think I need to add on the cost of capital. Uh, I think one of the challenges for financial institutions is that it's kind of easier to go after the new things than it is to transition the old ones. And so it's been relatively straightforward. I, I say that my colleagues will kill me, but it's been relatively <laughs> straightforward to build a really big position in, in wind power because it's new and it's exciting uh, and, and the propositions make a good deal of sense, but actually helping existing customers to transition their operations towards net zero is a whole lot harder, and that's the challenge we need to face into. Just on the point about nature, I mean, it has to be about climate and biodiversity, doesn't it? And I, I promised a call out for one of my fellow CISL students with whom I studied earlier this year, who this week 
put her whole life savings into trees because she felt it was the right thing to do. She was so buoyed up by being a cop. So in a way, it made Lloyd's 10 million that we're investing in trees over the next 10 years, you know, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's not our whole life savings. And so there's something about individuals coming forward and, and really facing into some of those challenges. And so Laura Gelder Robertson, I gave you a call out. Well done. Thank you very much. And that's actually a wonderful, yes? May I, can I just come back? I mean, the, the, question, the question about anger, if I, if I may, I, I think there is, there is something about, you know, that what we, I think we all know that we're talking about a massive retooling of our economy. And for something that large, you know, for the amount of capital that's going to be needed, need to be invested, despite the fantastic innovation, I think it's really important that collectively we are honest about what it's going to take. Because, I mean, nothing generates anger more than people who don't tell the truth and then who are found out sometime later. So I think, you know, all of us have a responsibility to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is a fantastic point at which we end this panel. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful. Thank you to the audience for their interactivity. And I pass it back to Claire. Do you have a mic? Sorry, <laughs> I won't, I assume you don't want me to start again. Um, but then how that passes out into different areas of your businesses, for example, on labeling and using new sort of tech and apps and what have you to reinforce that cre question of credibility and integrity to the, uh, even at the consumer level. The second, um, which was really about that question, to pick up on Janet's point about real. You know, I often like the phrase life and life chances. And... Um, of course, it radiates back to the anger piece as well. Uh, Jason on the video talked about social sustainability, and Wendy mentioned sustainable good. And I think probably, you know, I'm, a, I'm the age of the dinosaurs, but when I started, there was a great shyness about using some of these terms, talking about values, talking about purpose, in the way that is now becoming not only normal, but absolutely expected, not only by, by the Gen, Gen Z. Um, I think in that sense, the question was also raised, I think, by Jason on the video. Culture was mentioned. And I think that's very important to think about. That question of being human during that, this transition, bearing in mind we also have the digital revolution. There's a lot of things happening, coming down the tracks, at, you know, ordinary people in the street and at the scale of organizations and whole societies. So that literacy around culture um, and what is real is, I think, a really interesting thing that perhaps underpins some of these more business-oriented changes. And the third grouping was really around the public-private intersectionality, if you like. Um, we heard from Rachel about the policy undercarriage, and in lots of different ways, Janet, for example, how does government send the right signals to capital? Tony's points about the market. That becomes particularly important in some operating contexts where you have governments which, for any number of reasons, historic or cultural, do less investment from the public budget in certain public goods, which puts even more imperative, as Tony said, on moving those markets and, again, doing it in a way that is credible, has integrity, and is inclusive for the long term. And still under that public-private piece, um, we then had... Um, the conversation around greenwash, I mean, we could have, that alone could have had much more provocation if we'd had online views as well. I think one of the things that we see through our work in CSL, some really thoughtful, very senior voices saying, how do we know we're not just helping people do the wrong thing better? 
And it's a really difficult thing because not, this is not about impugning people's in individual commitment to the cause, but unless we bring these parts of the system into alignment, you have a real challenge. And so ESG, for some people, it's, it's, you know, it's not the sex on the street, it's Beelzebub, it's, it's, it's Satan, because they see it as being a small part of a big portfolio <laughs> so that the attention and the narrative building is around a subset of the whole as opposed to the fully green portfolio that needs to happen so that, you know, I would be happy if we got rid of the S word, which is, you know, Turkey's voting for Christmas. It's in the title of CISL. But the very fact that we put in what can seem like some people as a qualifier, that sustainability is a thing you add on as opposed to being the actual foundations is a really interesting journey I think we will travel. Um, and then the point that came from the audience about the mobilization, I think it was you, about mobilization for computer, com consumer finance and so on, tied beautifully into Wendy's comments about how we are thinking about that narrative building. And I think underpinning that for me is a very profound importance of respect. Respect not divided by generation or tech literacy or whatever, but understanding that most people do want to be able to do the right thing better within their means. And we need to really think about how those tools are, it's not just about our buildings accessible for the differently abled, it's about is the language we use accessible for those right across the spectrum so that we don't start from those who have in terms of educational opportunity or other and we are able from the get-go to think of this as radically open in the journey we travel. And um, fourth, and I'm nearly done, um, was about, I love this piece about the inside out. Um, from starting from what, what you can control. And I think it ties to the nature of purpose. We're seeing such interesting work within and beyond CISL and in international standards now. We have an architect, an author of that new standard in, the, in this room. Um, about thinking about the, the authenticity and the integrity of what we're doing and therefore starting with our people, um, you know, whether we're saying that all of UDF becomes, you know, activists and so on, but actually just saying harness the capacity. You know, my favorite definition of innovation is unmet need meets untapped resource. Well, I think that we tap very little of the extraordinary talent of workforces, or maybe we overwork them for what we do ask them to do, but actually the collective innovation capacity is extraordinary in this space. And last but not least, I wanted to come back to this question of anger. Um, when I think about the tectonic plates ahead, I sometimes I talk about the nature climate crisis, the people and power tectonic shifts, and techno-colonization. Is tech for good, or will our ownership and agency in the tech space also disappear in ways that we can see as a risk. And so there is both people and power as a shifting paradigm and loss of trust, but of course there's also people power. And so that is a thing for us to hold in mind, to get beyond these serial disconnects, which we heard particularly on my panel, about the fact that you know, business is calling out for these jobs of tomorrow, the, the upskilling, but it's not coming down the tracks. And at a personal level, I was really shocked when I moved to Cambridge a few months ago to discover it was the most unequal city in the UK. And I think that's a call to action for us as people working within and through the CRSL networks. That isn't tolerable. It isn't tolerable to have a situation where life and life chances is so polarized by place. And so the kinds of investments or decision areas that so many people in this room control are able to say, is it a fatality that each new city that's currently being invested in, in Africa or wherever you, anywhere in the world, is reproducing the same patterns of spatial and social inequity as have been a blight and are still a blight on America's landscape in particular. So I think there are some really earthy, real questions there to go back to the Janet, the real, that we can actually change and so on. That's more than enough for me. Um, I've got one other thing, because I picked up on things. Janet, again, you talked about reframe the losers. That idea that we don't, when we talk about, some people hate the word human capital because they think of commodification of the human. So picking back up on that respect piece, how do you actually deeply humanize what's going forward in a way that even if it's messy, it doesn't have to be perfect, and it won't be, well, there'll be lots of mistakes, but the actual commitment to it is something that is seen to be shared whether you sit around a government cabinet table, a board table, or you're an employee in one of these great companies who is given the agency to fly. And that, that is really excites me. It, it, it all excites me, to be honest. You've been an amazing audience, very engaged. Thank you for letting me 
fly away my little th my little sort of sets of thoughts. But much more importantly, we now have uh, coffee and I think cake at the back. So and again, a rousing thanks to our great panelists, um, to all of you, everybody who's been listening virtually, and now to the caffeine. Thank you. Thank you.